Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. Today, we're going to actually continue what's developed into a, an informal series for us. We've been talking about some of the cognitive functions in the Myers-Briggs system and talking about why the world needs them. We've talked about introverted sensing and we've talked about introverted thinking. And we realized, well, let's just kind of keep going. There's eight total functions. We've already covered two. Let's cover the rest of the six. So in today's show, we want to talk about one of the functions that I use primarily for my decision making, which is introverted feeling. So this is the function that all FPs in the Myers-Briggs system will use in the front seat of their car or the top of their cognitive function stack, depending on how you look at it. And other types as well. The TJs in the Myers-Briggs system will also use this, but it'll be in the back seat of their car or lower on their cognitive function stack. So this is going to apply to eight of the, the types using this function. And we're going to unpack why this function is so needed in today's world and then just have some freeform conversation around it. When we did the podcast called Why the World Needs Introverted Thinking, we did so because probably because I always feel that introverted thinking needs an advocate because <laughs> it's very easy to not like that function. It's easy to like that function in concept. I find that we like characters on TV that have that function because we like you know, sort of their brash sassiness and their radical honesty. And then when we get that function in real life, it feels kind of spiky and we don't particularly like it and we don't see why it has to exist in the world. So I I think it was actually the second time, not I think, I know for a fact it was the second time that we did a podcast on this on the topic of why the world needs introverted thinking. We had done one a few years ago. And then we started talking about why the world needs introverted sensing because I think that's also one that is very easy for people to overlook. And as we as we went through that particular function, we talked about it as people who use that part that function as an inferior, like that's at the bottom of our stack or that's our, our, the three-year-old in the car model. And so we have great deep appreciation for it, but we also have kind of a push-pull relationship and we were on even footing. You and I both have it in the same position in our car model. And so we were talking about it evenly. All the woes that yeah. show up for us. Yeah, the woes, but also the ways in which we admire it and see it as our aspiration. But with introverted feeling, because it is your judging function, Joel, as an ENFP, I think that we should a approach it kind of like we approached the Introverted Thinking podcast with you asking me a lot of questions. So I think what I want to do is I want to reverse that order and I want to ask you a bunch of questions about introverted feeling so that you can play advocate for your own function that you've done a lot of work around. Yeah, as long as it's not just an interview, we can back and forth. I'm, I'm totally cool with that. Yeah, well, I mean, if you remember in the other one, it almost turned into an interview. I don't, interview. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> we record so much content these days. I'm like, well, how did that go again? I remember, I mean, I remember the gist of it, but I don't remember the exact functional how we went through the show. Yeah, well, it did kind of feel like an interview, but that was good because then I got to say all the things I wanted to say. So it was kind of perfect. But as the person who isn't using introverted feeling at all in my four function stack or in my car model, I think it's more appropriate for you to play, sure. you know, to, to, to be the advocate for this particular function. And I, I'll do my best to ask solid questions. You are a natural and talented interviewer and I'm an okay interviewer that's learned to become a better interviewer by simply being around you and modeling you. But let's, let's see how I do. Yeah. Uh, I love the way you talked about being an advocate for these. And I think that's really the framework we're trying to come from is when we sit down to record these cognitive function shows around why the world needs these functions, we want to almost embody an advocate stance because we believe all eight functions are important, should be represented in the world, and should be honored in the way they show up. Now, that's a very introverted feeling thing of me to say, right? <laughs> As we get to talk about introverted feeling today. And I think what's really interesting about introverted feeling to kind of kick that off is we are on the global scale in an identity crisis as people. We don't know who we are. We have fluidity in everything around our identity. And it's weird that you would almost think that if identity is at the forefront of everything we're doing, introverted feeling would be at the forefront as well. But I see a lot of people confused about their identity, whether it's a particular aspect of their identity, uh, where they fit in the world, what is their role. Like So identity and roles sometimes come up and the, the different aspects of that. So I, I think there's a lot of wisdom with introverted feeling in, our to, in today's world to make sense of who are we as people? W what makes me me? What is my identity at the core level of who I am? 
I think these are questions a lot that introverted feeling deals with and talks about, struggles through, and is very fascinated by. Yeah, we even started our book uh, uh, with that topic, that the world seems to be going through an identity crisis, or a lot of people within the world. At least in our Western culture, that's certainly how it feels. And I think what's interesting about introverted feeling is that I don't know if that function always believes it has an answer, but because it's so interested in the topic, it does more to make sure that it's it's paying attention to that, that it's really holding those questions as and not something to brush under the rug, but to really, you know, to to hit head on. So as a person who uses introverted feeling, I'm I'm assuming much like a person like me who uses introverted thinking, there it's probably almost frustrating sometimes to use it. And as an advocate of that function in this particular podcast, what what do you think why do you think people sometimes overlook its value? Well, I know that for me, I've hated it for a long time. I mean, I've had a love-hate relationship with my introverted feeling. Now, I have a, a 10-year-old or tertiary process of extroverted thinking. It's polar opposite. And I've we all tend to rely upon our, our 10-year-olds. So there's just that naturally that comes. But also, I was basically... like I, I hated it because I realized it would... I think what it was is I feared it would limit my ability to interface with the outer world as an extrovert, as somebody that wanted to, I think I'm also a social subtype in the Enneagram, social six. And so I thought how I feel about stuff is going to be very subjective to me. It's going to be internal to me. And growing up in a religious paradigm, I resisted it because I knew that it would go against what quote unquote God wanted me to be, the identity he wanted to have for me, my family, my father, my circumstances, and the culture at large. If I'm doing what's honorable to me and what's my core ethics, that means I'm being quote unquote, selfish, self-involved, uh, not taking other people into account, self-absorbed. And these things, I don't want to be any of those things. So uh, for me personally, I resisted a lot of that, the notions that I could check in with myself. You know, even my religious background, it's like, who you know, who do you think you are? Do you think you're God? Like there's only one true God, right? You, you can't check in with yourself. Don't follow your feelings. Don't follow your true core identity. Your core identity, just because of who you are, not because of what you've done, because of who you are, you're, you're wrong, sinful, bad, and all those things. And I don't think that Judeo-Christian messaging of being bad and wrong just because of who we are is just limited to religious context. I think that all of us humans have somehow gotten this, this distilled message that's trickled down from the religionists of the, of the world. Even atheist people are people that struggle with not having a religion. You know, they're like, I don't, I don't buy any of this. I think they still get the message they're not okay. They're not okay. They can't just be who they are. They have to mold themselves into an identity that is accessible to the outside world, to the culture at large or the people out there, not who you are in here. And so I think a lot of times, uh, the original question was why would someone overlook the value of introverted feeling? I think because they feel like it will create selfishness, self-focus and lack of compassion or attunement to the needs of others. Yeah. You mentioned something uh, you said, uh, j- just to throw a little bone at people who are not religious, you said struggle with um, not having a religion. I think what you mean is struggle with the challenges of the world without necessarily having a religious paradigm to fall back on. Correct. That's what yeah. I meant. Uh, so you just mentioned that one of the reasons why people could really overlook the value of introverted feeling is that it appears to be selfish. Do you think introverted feeling is selfish? Uh, Selfish and subjective. That's what it is. So it's very internal and subjective. So both those things. I, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's selfish. I think it's self-focused. I think it's self-identified. It's self-generated. It looks to the self and the core values and the motivations of the self as the guiding star of moving through the world. And sometimes that's hard to interface with other people. I mean, if if you're an introverted feeling primary listening right now, an IFP, you know how much richness is in your heart and your mind. And if you're an EFP, you know what's going on down there. It's all this in complexity. And you know that a lot of it is not acceptable to the outside world, or at least it's not given, a message not given to you is acceptable. It, and, and a lot of times you might hear the message, you're selfish, you're self-absorbed, you're not looking to the needs of others or outside of yourself enough. So I, I do think that it is, I don't believe it's selfish, but I do believe it is self-focused as far as the origination point of what to do. It's the core of who am I and how does that inform my actions going forward? What do you think is the difference between being self-focused and selfish? 
Well, I don't think that just because you're self-focused is a taking energy. I think selfish is a taking energy. And you can be self, you can still have core values and attune to yourself and not take from others, not take from the world more than you give. There's almost kind of this, as humans, we have like almost like our uh, relational equity always running, almost like bank accounts, like emotional bank accounts or social bank accounts with people. And I think that, you know, most humans strive to kind of have some equilibrium in the back and forth of value exchange there. And I don't think that just because you're self-focused means you won't be contributing into the matrix of sociability. I don't think you automatically are a taker just because you're looking at yourself as the guiding the guiding point of your life. Yeah. So what do you think is the gift that introverted feeling gives then? If it's not if it's not taking energy, if it can also be giving energy, what are the things it gives? Well, one thing that comes to my mind that like off the top of my head is uh, fidelity. Fidelity of the human experience. It's extremely personal and subjective into my heart of what's going on for me. And I realized that, oh, like it's kind of that notion, I think we've said it before on podcasts, what, like, the more personal something, the more universal it is. Like, if I struggle with this insecurity, or whatever insecurity it is, fill in the blank, and it's so personal to me, I'm like, man, that is a challenge. I start to track that motivation, that insecurity, and I start to see, oh, I bet other people actually have this as well. So I think the gift it gives is if I can tune into, like at the end of the day, my core values, my core motivations... And what strikes me and what resonates or doesn't resonate with me at a core value, my experiences of how I move through the world, I believe it gives the gift of incredible nuanced empathy and fidelity. Because if you look, again, look at, look at introverted feelings opposite of extroverted thinking, right? What's great about extroverted thinking is that it creates a, it creates a metricized, almost behavior viewpoint of human interactions or what we do as people. Like I can measure it. I can look at something that's outputted and say that's good, bad, valuable, not valuable. But in order to measure it outside of ourselves, we have to remove so much fidelity, so much nuance, so much depth of understanding because it has to be obvious on the outside world to interface with multiple, you know, multiple entities, multiple nodes in a system that we lose fidelity when we externalize it. So I think introverted feeling gives us as humans, the human race, the human population, the human species the ability for us to tap into the deepest parts of our motivations and really get a sense of them on a personal level, almost like, um, like a coal miner for your heart. And then you bring it out and you can show empathy to people because you understand how this might strike someone because it strikes you so deeply. So why, why do you think that that's needed? Like what, wouldn't life be simpler if we were just you know, we're just seeing things in a way that kind of fit everybody. Like, why Why do you think that that fidelity is so needed? I think that things would be simpler, quite frankly. It, the, I don't want to say the downside, but the, the benefit of introverted feeling does bring with it complexity and nuance. And not, it's not easy to, like, metricize or distill down to some kind of external measurement. Personally, I think it's important because it it taps into the human spirit. It, it taps into the like the depths of what's actually going on under the surface for all the behaviors we manifest. Again, I used to think introverted feeling was all about core values, like what those values were, and and it is to, to a large degree. But it also is about the motivations of why I and other people do what we do, and those motivations. And I use motivations plural on purpose is because it's not one motivation. Any action I take. It's not one motivation, it's motivations. And I think if you don't have introverted feeling, you mistake motivations for motivation, singular, not plural. I think it's very easy when you're measuring stuff in the outside world. Oh, this person voted for this candidate. That means they're this kind of person and there's their motivation, one motivation, right? Or this person likes this music. So that means they're this motivation of person. Like it's very simple to oversimplify people and assume they have one thing that's driving them. And it's been my experience and talking to other introverted feeling users that we don't have, no one ever has a singular motivation. We have a complexity of motivations that move us forward as people. And most people are not aware of those. Most people don't realize that they have, you know, what we, we'd label, I don't believe in good and bad, but we'd label good, quote unquote, and bad, quote unquote, motivations in their life. And it's like, which ones are, are working in, in tandem to create this uh, expression or this movement or this outcome in your life. And I think introverted feeling gives the world a, a viewpoint. I think this is why they go into the arts. Introverted feeling people, FPs, end up in Hollywood, in music, 
in the arts because it allows an expression of just all the complexity of motivation. And we love movies with characters that are complex, not one dimensional. We love movies that show you the good guy who has his demons, who struggles with the darker motivations and has to overcome them or just deal with them as they come. Like they come and they come along with all the good motivations, but he or she has to deal with all the darkness there too because they're just coming along for the ride. And we love to see characters like that because it, it shows us, it's a reflection back to all of us that that's really what's going on inside of us. And I think that's what introverted feeling does so well. Why is that beneficial to anybody not using introverted feeling? It eliminates confusion. I think people don't know why they do what they do. Like a lot of people get up. Like, have you ever seen, for example, uh, like somebody get in an argument, maybe even online or offline, like this this really petty argument, and it escalates and keeps escalating. And you're like, maybe you're an observer, or maybe you're even in it. But let's say you're an observer. You're watching two people escalate something really petty about maybe I don't know. Even like on the freeway, like two people like have road rage and they pull over and start yelling at each other around road rage. It's like there's so much motivation going on here. There's so many reasons why they're arguing. They're not really arguing about what they think they're arguing about, right? They think they're arguing about road rage, that you cut me off, you jerk, you know, no, you did this, blah, blah, blah. And that's usually never the actual argument. So I think what it is when you get into motivations, you realize what really is going on for you. The reason why it's needed for people that aren't introverted feeling, I think in particular, is to know, oh, the reason I'm yelling at my spouse or the reason why I'm mad at my son isn't because of reason X, Y, Z that's that's quote unquote obvious on the surface. Oh, I see. I've got resentment toward my son. You know, I'm just pulling this out of my head. I have resentment for, towards my son because he's the son of my ex-wife and I have some resentment toward her. So I'm feeling some resentment. So I've got heat toward him. It's actually not toward him. It's toward my ex-wife and you're tracking all those motivations and you, that nuance is so helpful to know what's going on, right? So we don't just behave wildly without knowing why we're behaving. Do you think that that's one of the reasons why the f- the function itself is so good at holding space for other people, uh, like holding a space for their emotional experience? Because it pauses before it makes you know leaps of assumptions that oh this is what's happening for that individual. It's almost like it 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 pauses before it. Um, determines why the person needs to talk about whatever they need to talk about, or it pauses before it makes assumptions about what's going on for another individual, because it knows that there's a complexity there that can't be seen on the surface. And so that's one of the reasons why it's so good at just listening. Every American-based judicial system, so the public defender offices in every major city in the United States, and my guess is other countries as well, but I don't live in other countries, so I don't know. Every public defender's office, though, is probably staffed with an incredibly high percentage of introverted feeling people because of what you just said, that holding space for motivations, even criminals behaving very badly, introverted feeling people, you know, public defender that's an introverted feeling person will say, this person isn't expressing just the motivation of pure evil to do this bad act, this murderous thing, this whatever thing. They have a complexity of emotion. And even in the midst of them behaving badly, they need to be honored as an individual with all of the complexity of motivations that come from being a human, a human on this planet. And as a public defender, I want to I want to honor that, hold space for that, and even defend it, even defend that person, because no one is 100% pure evil. Just like, and this is the key, no one is 100% pure good either. And and again, good, bad, evil. You know, I, I look more at life affirming, life non affirming, or like you know. Uh, life destructive, life affirming is kind of my metric for good and bad. I don't look at good and bad because that's more of a moralistic structure and that could be socialized. So I don't look at socialized ethics or morals to be the way I base my life. Again, that's a very introverted feeling thing to say, right? I look more at the life affirming or life negating elements. And I want to choose life affirming things over life negating things. I think when you talk about public defenders and how there's probably a high percentage of people who are public defenders that use introverted feeling, there's a lot of pushback those people get. Like when somebody does something egregious or horrible that's hard to understand and a person chooses to defend them to believe that everybody should have a fair shake or nobody is truly perfectly good or perfectly evil, there's a lot of pushback those people get. Is that something that you feel as somebody who uses introverted feeling, not as a public defender, but is that 
Is that something that you're aware of as well? Is this idea that if I am understanding towards somebody who everybody else is at this point written off or demonizing or determining is, you know, is wholly bad, that, uh, you know, like, like I, I'm really aware of how judgmental people are and I've got to navigate that space very carefully. When people are judgmental like that, I, the, the phrase doth protest too much comes to my mind. I think it's them attempting to push away their own introverted feeling, even if they don't use introverted feeling, but the, in, the inner parts of them that resonate with maybe the evil motivations this person had or the reflection of any evil motivation they have. They may not be a one-to-one. Like let's say there's a murderer. You may not have like murderous motivations, but that murderer you're looking at reflects to you some of the other darker or life destructive motivations you have. And so two things are happening. Uh, One is you are panicked that your motivations, any dark motivations that that person mirrored to you, the world will see because you've been told all your life, if I see those, you're a disgusting, horrible person and we will demonize you as a society. So don't ever show us those. So we hide them. So I think when you see that murderous person, it triggers in you Oh man, I've got I've got some icky stuff in me, and by you know by the grace of God, quote unquote, <laughs> I don't act upon it. Whatever those icky things are, and so I want to make sure that I demonize that person helping that murderer and the murderer himself or herself to ensure that my icky stuff is never seen. I have to like protest so much to prove I have nothing icky in me. It's got to stay as far away from me, and I think that's really what's going on there when people protest that. And, and it is weird that I have, I often have sympathy for villains in stories and in life a lot. Not, I mean, not in a higher degree than victims, but I do know that like, I kind of feel, again, an introverted feeling, every, every villain is kind of a victim too. Like usually people become villains because they were victims in a way and we're, they're all caught in the drama triangle, right? They just switch spots. So I have a tendency to feel sympathy because I know that any of us on this planet could get to that place with the right conditioning, the right circumstances, and certain motivations that we all carry with us being honored or grown inside of us. It's, I mean, humanity is is just a couple of clicks away from devolving into crazy chaos and animalistic behavior, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, we're just, we, we have a sheen of civility, but it's, it's barely there. It's just, under the surface is uncivil behavior. And I think all introverted feeling people understand this. What's the value in not just keeping it status quo? What's the value in not just going, you know, sort of pushing down that darkness? Like why, why do we have to see that darkness? It's why coming it- out anyway, because it's going to come out anyway. I mean, it's, it's the darkness will, will spring up whether we honor it or not. And I'm not saying honor it, like celebrate it. I'm saying, honor it to say, this is a voice represented inside of me. It needs some kind of an outlet or it's going to feel marginalized. You know what? We, we, you and I talk about this on PH all the time. What we resist persists. So as, as humans, if we resist some of the darkness that's in all of our hearts and we don't have a way to talk about it, it's going to go in the shadows. It's going to find its outlet somewhere. And I think getting things out and, and being forthcoming with the authentic ways that we feel about things, even if they're not the most pleasant, being able to have spaces to talk about that. Now, that cr- that requires a, a level of trust to be able to talk about some of that stuff. And we are in a very complex, very large population world where we don't have a lot of trust anymore with each other. And so I don't think it can be done in broader society. Like you're not going to go on Twitter and talk about the darkness of your heart and expect a civil discourse to, to be engaged around that. But with, with close intimates of people that have done a lot of work to be able to hold space for certain topics and certain frameworks, I think there can be space made for a lot of deep work in understanding our repressed motivations that may not be the best, you know? So I think that it will come out regardless if we, if we allow that space or not, it's going to be manifested somehow. So I look at it and say, why don't we find healthier ways to find this? I think let introverted feeling people dig in there and find this for us kind of collectively because we seem to be the most talented at it. And then we can also be Sherpas to help other people find that as well inside themselves. And I think uh, introverted feeling is, is using emotions to find the truths that other maybe types would find offensive. Like 
again, those darker motivations and things and things that people, people may not even ever be aware of them in themselves, like consciously, probably unconsciously, but consciously. And uh, I think by digging those and using the emotions to express it in the form of art or performance or some kind of expression, I think gives people a way to kind of access that as, as introverted feeling people. And obviously there's art and expression created by a non introverted feeling people, but I think introverted feeling people tend to be attracted to those things because they love to try to express some of that and allow other people to tap into something of what that might look like. And that is a safe, you know, when I talk about creating safe environments to talk about darker motivations, watching Silence of the Lambs and, you know, Hannibal Lecter, it, it allows you to almost get into a simulated experience of what it must be like to be a serial killer cannibal <laughs> and have a sense of that feeling in a movie form. So I think movies and popular media have become a a cultural outlet for introverted feeling in a lot of ways for us to mine the depths of character and what motivates people on, on deep core levels. So I think there is some space for that. It's hard to have an articulated discourse around these things. And maybe that's for good because that's one thing that introverted feeling struggles with sometimes because of the complexity of motivations, because of all the deep richness of the experiential elements of what's going on for me at core levels of motivation when I start to speak, and if you're introverted feeling, you know this, you start to articulate what's going on for you. It's just a jumbled mess sometimes. Like you're like, I'm here, and it's, it's, people can poke holes in it logically. And you're, and the moment you start to speak, you lose the fidelity of all the feelings because you're trying to create digital articulated words to mean complexity of feeling, which is almost like, to me, it feels impossible sometimes. I have like an emotion or some fo- feelings going on about something. And well, how do you, how do you, what do you think about this? It's like, well, I think like this very complex emotional experience about this, which isn't clear. It has good, bad, and complex motivations all attached to it. So I don't even know how to begin to try to tell you. So I'll try to speak about it in terms that you might understand, like emotions, like anger. Okay, what kind of anger? Get more nuance there, but it doesn't do it any justice. Or maybe sadness, try to get nuance around sadness, but it's never going to be the complete picture of what I'm feeling. So I think art is a way or expression is a way to try to get some of the nuances out, the complexities. Uh, I think introverted feeling is better at demonstration than explanation. I think introverted thinking is great at explanation, that articulated thought. But introverted feeling, demonstration is so important. And that also plays to its other side of its polarity, right? Extroverted thinking, which is external, right? It's externally put out there in the world. And so performance is also kind of satisfying a little bit of the other, or, or expressions are satisfying a little bit of that as well. You're extroverted something and extroverting something to satisfy that polarity. And often that comes in the form of art, expression, etc. So you mentioned that introverted feeling gets in touch with some of the deeper truths uh, in an individual. And when we talked about introverted thinking and why the world needs introverted thinking revisited, that's what I mentioned. I mentioned that introverted thinking gets in touch with like the truths that are going on inside a person, like the, the your honest thoughts. But would you say that the truths you're referring to with introverted feeling is getting in touch with people's honest desires? Yes. It's motivation for action. It's not belief like TI or introverted thinking. I think it's more the root cause of my behavior. It's the root of why I behave the way I behaved, the motivational structure of my my life. And so because it taps into desire, do you think that that's why people are so quick to demonize the truths that are mined by introverted feeling because we say we think that our desires say something about us. I think so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that our desires... I think our desires definitely... I think they do say something about us, quite frankly. I mean, I think that what we desire speaks volumes. I don't necessarily think it, it indicates the good or badness, again, of a person. It's just what they desire. It's a choice they want to make. They're just decisions or choices. Um, but I think it just bears out like what they're attuned to, like how, how well I'll vibe with someone knowing that. Yeah, because when I think about introverted thinking, one of one of the, I mean, my, the function I'm using, one of the things I appreciate about it is that because it gives space for honest thoughts, if those thoughts are not high quality, then we're able then to discuss them with another person and have somebody push against them and then refine them and get to higher quality thoughts. And if introverted feeling is more tapped into desire and motivation and intent, 
by revealing that desire, like I think sometimes we mistake desire as something static. Like a thought is easy to adjust and change, but because desire is attached to emotion, this, there's this idea that your desires are just your desires and you can't do anything about them. But if I'm going to draw parallels to the function of introverted thinking, would you say that being able to articulate regardless of whether or not that's in conversation or through art or through you know f- some form of expression, being able to showcase those desires does the same service for a person. It helps them reflect back what those desires are. And then when they put them out into the world, then the world can push back against them and then they can refine them. You're talking about a calibrated experience where uh, I have a desire for, let's just say I have a desire to generate wealth and I attempt to generate wealth. I, I'm trying to understand your question. So Sorry, like I'm asking saying. it in a very introverted thinking way. Yeah, so so <laughs> I have a desire to generate wealth in my life, let's say. Like I want to start my own business and I want to generate wealth. And you're saying that when I start that path, I put that desire out there, I start that that path forward. And then what was the, like in the practical example of that, what, what does the world give me in that scenario? Well, actually, I wasn't thinking in terms of something like that, which I would personally define as a neutral. And I think most people would. Um, unless they had attached a value statement to whether or not a person should be making money. I'm talking about more but, like I have a desire to cheat on my spouse. By, by the way, this is really good to have this conversation back here, this little bit of uh, disconnect when yeah. I was like, okay, w- explain to me the question. Because you're asking this in a data set abstract like piece of data. And I almost need like, I'm basically looking for some narrative to find the through line. And this is something else introverted feeling does really well is it works, it deals in narratives and stories and it finds the truths inside the story. So the reason why I started to paint kind of in an extroverted thinking kind of way, an externalized goal and story framework using my introverted feeling and motivations of desire toward you know starting my own business is because I'm trying to create some kind of a, a way we can talk about this with a narrative. And you don't want the narrative. You almost want the piece of information void of narrative. And I think there's a disconnect sometimes between introverted thinking and introverted feeling where Introverted thinking is totally cool with a disembodied piece of just random data or information. They know how to make sense of that. Introverted feeling needs some kind of a story timeline often to drop that onto. And so that's why I'm almost like, so when you gave me the example of cheating on a spouse desire, now I've got a story to like look at almost on a, and it almost like on a literal timeline. You know, art can be random access art, like a painting on the wall that's not timeline focused. But a lot of expression is timeline focused. Music is on a timeline. It evolves over a time period. A movie is a timeline piece of art. Performance art or stage or, or stand-up comedy is timeline art. It's a performance through time. Yeah, and I imagine it's because if I'm going to again make a parallel with my process of introverted thinking, I'm usually tracking when somebody's ready for a piece of information. And so I'll talk to an individual, and if I'm trying to get them to understand a concept... I'll pace out how I describe it or explain it because I know that people become more and more ready for certain thoughts. And that's probably something introverted feeling is doing, that when it's expressing and trying to get people to sort of understand something that isn't maybe native to them or find something inside that is native but that they pushed away, there's probably sort of a building that has to happen over a timeline in order to make it so the person is ready to find that piece of who they are inside. Yeah, Quentin Tarantino notwithstanding most of the end of the movie happens at the end of the movie. You know, like the climax of the movie happens at the end because you're emotionally ready for it. That's when you're ready. Like there's almost a formula of three acts to write a movie and then you build toward the climax at the end and then it's resolved and then you you close out the, the film. So I would agree with that. I think that introverted feeling has a knack for knowing almost like when people are ready for emotional spikes, like kind of through a timeline in a way. So that's kind of an abstract way to talk about it. But let's go back to your original question, which was, let me see if I can get this. So so let's look at the framework of, of a desire to cheat on your partner, your spouse, your lover, whoever. Yeah. Well, and uh, I think if, if a person just said, yeah, so I was actually planning on cheating on my spouse and I was like, I was really thinking about it and I was asking myself how I'd go about it. And then I, you know, and then I decided not to. But just by talking about that desire, I think that they would probably offend a bunch of people in a room. Like just having that desire would say something about the individual, even if they hadn't gone through with it. And I, I'm wondering if you're suggesting that introverted feeling can hear things like that and not make a leap of judgment. But but I don't think that's necessarily true because I would imagine that if a person themselves had plugged in fidelity or, um, you know, like being faithful to a spouse if the person had indicated that they were 
ready, willing, had the desire to do this, but didn't do that, it would even strike a person using introverted feeling in the wrong way. So where where like what's the reconciliation between that? I think that's the this is where I've made a distinction between core values, which is often bandied about for introverted feeling. Like, well, there's you know, it's all about core values. And when I when I discovered for myself and have gone down the road of tracking motivations, I realized those aren't the same thing. And motivations are almost like what is, like what's coming up inside my introverted feeling? Like what are those things spiking? And there's a plethora of motivations, good and bad. Again, good and bad, however you individually would determine that. I have my own metric again, like I said. So motivations I'm watching and it's a plural, it's a plethora, it's like a soup of motivations that get me to want or desire something or to behave in a certain way. Core values come in as a throttle mechanism, as my guardrails for, it's almost like the core motivations are the gas in the engine of my car and the core values are the guardrails to keep me in on the lane, like keep me on the road so I don't fly off the road randomly. Because there's so much complexity of motivations that without core values in place, you are almost, you are almost subject to whatever the strongest motivation is in the moment. So if you're really let's say angry or you're like you're in a you're in a situation context or something that would allow the quote unquote bad motivations to come to the surface and behave badly your core values go over there as guardrails to say wait a minute you feel this way right now but we have a deeper core value here than the motivation you're feeling to do xyz so you just got in a fight with your spouse last night and it's been weeks since you guys have had sex and you're feeling really low self esteem right now and of course you want to go cheat. Like you, you feel the desire to go cheat or, or whatever the bullshit reason is, right? The, all the motivation that's pre- prevalent or prominent right now. And so the motivation's strong. And then from an introverted feeling standpoint, you check into the core values you have and say, is it in my nature? Is my identity the kind of identity of a person who would cheat? So you, it, it allows you then to prioritize your motivations rather than the emotions that you're feeling to prioritize them. Right, you actually get to. It's like a. It's like a tool. Your core values are like a tool to throttle your motivations and put them in their proper order, and you become dominant over yourself. Then, with with proper core values and proper identity, you now are in control of. I should say, you're in influence of your motivations, not in control of them. I don't believe you're ever in control of your motivations, but you are heavily influential in your motivations. You have a throttle mechanism, a guidepost mechanism, almost like an inner parent for yourself for this wild child that feels what it feels right now and wants to behave and how it wants to behave. I don't know if that answered your question or the the line of thought you're going down, but that's how I see it. To some extent, in all of that, you said, you know, like uh, you got, you had a fight and your self-esteem is really low and you haven't had sex for quite a few weeks. And you said, and whatever bullshit reasons you have. So is that you applying one of your core values onto it by saying all the reasons are bullshit? Or do you just mean like generally when we have a bunch of reasons for what we're doing, they're all kind of BS? Yeah, all reasons are bullshit. All reasons are bullshit. I mean, in other other words, they're all made up. Like everybody, 100% of the people on the planet, we're making up our reasons all the time. And we think we're being logical. And there might be a billion people that agree with us. We're like, look, a billion people agree with me. So my reasons are legit. Come on, you made them up just like everybody else. Like, we're all making up our reasons going. Th- and this, I know that's controversial. A lot of people aren't going to agree with me on that one. <laughs> but I think if you really get, and this is one thing I think introverted feelings given me is I realized that. I realized that a lot of these motivations and things are arbitrary. That's again why core values are so important. Because those are almost like what you choose to install there. Because the motivations, it's like sometimes they happen to us. It's not like we can just choose to feel this way or choose these motivations or these desires. They almost are like, I mean, there's all sorts of factors at play. So when you say bullshit reasons, what you actually probably mean more is rationalizations. Sure. Like whatever we're telling ourselves are the reasons why we want something. They could be an accurate diagnostic, but they're still rationalizations, especially if they go contrary to a person's core values. I believe we humans get what we want honestly, at the end of the day. This is very controversial, what I'm saying here, because I know that would fly in the face of a lot of people that say things happen to them. And I don't, I don't necessarily discount that. I think there is, there is something to be said. So I'm overvaluing what I'm saying right now. I understand there are people that are victimized. Things happen to them they didn't ask for. Like if I park my car on the side of the road and it gets hit by another vehicle while I'm inside a store, I didn't, I didn't actually create that necessarily. Now I'm responsible for where I parked my car but I didn't create the damage to my car. So in that sense, 
I guess I could say I'm a victim to that circumstance, right? Things just happen. People, I believe, get ultimately what they want in life. And then they backward, backward rationalize why that thing happened or why they got that thing. Good or bad. Like, I don't care what the outcome is. X happens and then we rationalize why X happened. Whether it was, and even, even the situation by getting hit with the car, <laughs> like the, the car hitting my car, parking there, that happens. I'm going to have a bunch of rationalizations to the reasons for that. It might be I project incompetency or ill intent onto the person driving the other vehicle. But I have a lot of rationale why that happened, why that other car ran into my car. And I think that we do that in everything in life. Like I think we go through life, a lot of us just obeying whatever we feel or whatever our motivations are in the moment. And then we look for outside sources to support our actions as an apology to say, no, you were, we want people to say, no, you were right in that behavior because of X, Y, Z. And that motivation was proper and your action was proper. And again, I don't care whether it's quote unquote, good, bad, whatever. That's what we all look for as humans. We do X behavior and then we look to rationalize X behavior or X things happens and we look to make sense of it by telling ourselves a story of why it happened. Like, oh, nothing bad, nothing good ever happens in my life. Look, even I park my car at the grocery store and someone runs into it. Oh, boo-hoo, woe is me. Like we have stories for all of it, everything. But I think introverted feeling understands that we have stories for all of this stuff that happens it doesn't make it necess- it doesn't make those stories necessarily true but introverted feeling thinks in terms of narratives oh yeah absolutely and, and so these stories are maybe how introverted feeling is particularly tapped in because it understands that we're all thinking in narratives so what i hear you saying and i know you you kept saying this might be really controversial almost making it sound like it is controversial well people really don't want to let go of their victimhood like i know a lot of people and they they want that's why I'm saying it's controversial is because I know people when they have a victim feeling, they feel like a victim. And rightly so. Something really shitty happened to you. Really shitty that you didn't invite. You were victimized. Like it's true. That's absolutely true. And the reason why I say it's controversial is because I think people, when they hear me say that, might think I'm trying to take victimhood from them. That is not what I'm trying to do. If you need to feel like a victim in whatever situation, I think that's okay to do that. But just remember like we're all rationalizing whatever happens. Like we all have, like not rationalizing, we all have stories about what ha- what happened. But I just want to be very clear that's why I said it was controversial. Right, because I think what I'm hearing you say is that there's there are the things that happen to us or the things that maybe even sometimes we manifest and some and things that sometimes we don't manifest, right? There's stuff that happens to us. And then there's the story of why it happened to us. And you're talking about introverted feeling being tapped into what our story is about like the narrative through line these are sometimes we'll even call them limiting beliefs these are the narratives of why like you mentioned see nothing works out in my life i even got my car hit so it becomes part of some of this sort of grandiose narrative separate maybe from the incident itself there are incidents and when people have terrible things happen to them and that is legitimate and stories oftentimes help us understand what happened to us like the narrative or story is part of how we reorganize our world after a chaotic, destructive Absolutely. event, right? Is that effectively what you're saying? Absolutely. And so there's there's the narrative that helps us maybe process the emotional experience. That's probably why the narrative comes, because introverted feeling is also a way for us to process our emotions. So the narratives are there. And I'm hearing what you're saying is that introverted feeling recognizes the the need for the narrative because it thinks in terms of it, but it also sort of understands the limitation of just what that narrative can do for us. Is it's that It's just accurate? a narrative. Yeah. Like it understands, yes, it actually, it, it understands the need of it and it realizes that it's just a story and stories are chosen for their value. Like that same person that get hit by the car, like if I park my car, I get a hit. I could be, look at this. Oh crap. It's, it's, I always get hit or I could come out and have a different story and say, Thank God I got hit while my car was parked and I wasn't stopped at a stoplight and I got hurt or died or I was on the freeway. Like, like literally that story is malleable. You could have a different perspective on it. Or you could even maybe, maybe you just got a raise last week and you say, wow, I'm grateful my car got hit at the same time I got a raise because now I've got an ability to pay for this thing. So all three of those stories are valid and which ones are more empowering to me? And I think that's the thing that I personally always look at in those ways. I want to find the stories that keep me unstuck and help me move forward, not make me feel stuck and like I have no power or anything. So 
going back to introverted feeling, the narrative is important. And the narrative is important because, first of all, we all think in terms of narrative because all of us have introverted feeling. So narratives are important in general because that's how we're wired to think. And second, narratives are how we process what happens to us. And the reason why introverted feeling is so valuable is because it understands the power of those narratives and it monitors it. It, it like hel- I'm assuming that this is healthy introverted feeling, by the way. Correct. So healthy introverted feeling allows us to look at our narratives and then ask ourselves, uh, m- maybe, maybe there's a limitation to what these narratives can do. Like maybe there was a narrative I had for a certain time that allowed me to process through and organize past, say, a very destructive, chaotic event. And that narrative was very important for me. But because I'm tapped into narratives themselves and understand how powerful they are, I need to kind of keep my finger on the pulse of these narratives. I need to make sure that they're, because I also understand that my intent and my desires live in the same space as my narratives, that I have to be careful about them because I have to also understand how they connect to my intent and connect to my desires and how they're feeding into those things. And so now I'm bringing something to the world. Now it's not just something that happened to me, but now because I've constructed maybe identity around it, right? Because that's all part of this too, is that narrative of who I am and what it means about me because I've constructed identity around it, then I need to kind of check in with that and make sure that that's all as it should be because then my desires and intent and what I bring out into the world is closer, a closer, more accurate, excuse me, more authentic reflection of how I see myself. Yes, because I think when introverted feeling isn't as healthy, it will take, it will take a, an event, X, Y, Z, and create a story around the event XYZ and paint it in a way that serves its own best interests in an impenetrable, inarguable way. So I, I was on a, as an example, I, I was looking through some old journals from one of my, I think I was like 16 at the time, a mission trip to Europe when I was a Christian in, the, in like the church culture I was in. A group of teenagers went over to Europe. I was part of it to do some mission work, to talk about God and to work in some schools and some orphanages and some other things in in Europe. And I remember we went over there and I remember this one evening, some of the students got to eat a certain meal that I and some other students were excluded from. (laughs) And, And I remember feeling at the time, looking through my journal, this all came back to me, but I remember feeling very, very hurt by that scenario and that situation. And I'm reading the story in my journal now, you know, decades later, and I'm reading this story about how I painted this scenario of this group of students over here got this privilege, and I was part of the group of students that didn't. And I watched how I painted it in a narrative that was so unjust. I was, I was the victim. It was so unjust that these students over here got this. And, it, and looking back, it wasn't that bad. Like, if I look at it with an honest assessment of what happened... It wasn't, I was not the victim here. I was not being as marginalized as I thought as I would, even at the time I remember feeling, I, I'm, not, I'm not being as marginalized as I'm portraying in my writing of this journal, but I was so mad about it that I wanted to capture it and express it in the way I wrote down what happened in order to paint this narrative that I was being exploited, I was a victim, I was getting the short end of the stick, I'm losing out, this other group of students over here is winning out, Boo hoo, boo hoo! Look how marginalized and unjust this is toward me. I even knew it. Now reading it back, I remember now writing that and remembering casting that narrative on purpose to capture it, to capture the feeling I had of feeling like I was marginalized. And I amped it up, and then I went and wrote in my journal, and I was going to really just capture this feeling, to almost like some cosmic, you know, at the time I believed in God, so almost like cosmic God would set this straight someday or something, this injustice that happened, and I wanted to capture the narrative. But looking back, I realized I created that narrative a lot. Like, I created most of that, that scenario. I made sure I painted it in a way that made it look like there was bigger disparity than there actually was, just to satisfy my own ego, to satisfy my own desires, and all that. And so this is the one thing I think not one thing, this is one of the things I think introverted feeling has to watch out for is because we're so good at narrative and stories and because we are tracking what we want and sometimes we don't know how to make it happen in the outer world, 
because we don't have extroverted thinking to make things happen, right? It's either our 10-year-old tertiary or our three-year-old inferior process as introverted feeling users. We tend to try to use the emotion or the story spinning that is our talent with our introverted feeling to paint a picture to get the outcome we want instead of the direct outcome, you know, through the, through the process that is in our strength. So we have to be very careful not to... And I see sometimes in social movements and other things, I think it's introverted feeling people doing this. They couch things in a way it's not actually genuine. It's not actually what went down or how the actual feelings are there. They're amping it up to get a result, which is understandable. That's what we do as introverted feeling. But we have to be rigorous with being authentic to what it is and not let our desires and and our wishes and motivations cloud the stories because these stories have effects on other people. Because narratives are powerful. Extremely powerful. They are some of the biggest motivators on the planet. So then what does in, how, why does the world need introverted feeling? If introverted feeling is so good at spinning narratives and sometimes it'll spin a narrative, I mean, regardless, some, I think sometimes, and I just want to make a caveat, Sometimes when we talk about social movements, people think we're talking about, because we're, we're very intimate on the podcast and people are listening to us through their headphones oftentimes, and it feels like we're talking to that individual person. And so they think we're talking to them. When we talk about social movements, we talk about like yeah. most of them. And we're not directly talking <laughs> no. to anti-vax people right now. Like no. if that's your social movement, that's cool. Like we're not, right. but like a lot of anti-vax people think we're talking about them because you're here with us as a third person. So right. you think it's like your cause, but it's causes in general. Right. We're not, we're not talking about any specific movement. We're just talking about movements in general and how they operate and work from both sides of the aisle and from... All sorts of spectrums, yeah, and uh, and religious and non-religious and political and apolitical and all sorts of movements, right? Because there's because it's a hotbed right now, and so and and also by the way, when we talk about victims and marginalization and that sort of thing, once again, I don't know if I've met anybody from any particular political or religious or name one of the other major factions of the world that sort of you know define who we are. I haven't met anybody who doesn't think that they're not the marginalized person, right? <laughs> like, like you'll see, you'll hear people say, you know, so and so are the most persecuted people on the planet. Oh, that's <laughs> my old Christian days. Right. Christians, you know, Christians are the most persecuted people on the planet. And then I hear like every cult and every subculture say that about themselves. Yeah. So we're kind of talking about this in general. And yet at the same time, as you mentioned, one of the reasons why might be because n these narratives are so powerful for being able to move, you know, move something that is a desired outcome forward. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because we're talking about why introverted feeling is needed. So you mentioned the thing that people need to keep their finger on the pulse of, or at least what I'm hearing, is a disingenuous spin, right? Like, like you can, like if you had painted that narrative about not getting access to whatever meal these other students on the mission trip got. And I would imagine that, you know, that doesn't sound like a big deal, but when you're on a mission trip, particularly when you're, you know, someplace else away from home, it's it can be brutal. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of... Cold showers. Cold showers. <laughs> it's a lot of like... On purpose sometimes. The mission bases would turn it off, I remember, like just to make sure we had a real mission experience. Yeah, they'll kind of almost torture you a little bit just to make sure you're really feeling it. And then you've got... All, and you're doing all of this work in behalf of other people. You're not getting paid, right? Like this is all voluntary service. And so a really nice meal is sometimes just such a relief and a break from all of that. And if somebody else gets it and you didn't, that can actually be like kind of in your mind, it can be a big deal. But now, now that you've done all this work around introverted feeling, I'm curious to find out what the narrative and story would be for you now. What do you think a healthier one would be? And and how do you feel introverted feeling can actually like be a force for good in these movements? Like, like let's talk about movements in a positive way. Let's talk about, you know, social movements and religious movements or whatever movement you want, you, you're a part of that you think is super important. How can introverted feeling be a really good positive force for good in these movements so that it's not amping things up just to kind of twist the knife and the narrative and get what they want at the end of it, regardless of whoever that is. But actually, how could introverted feeling be a force for good and, and maybe a movement or not even in a movement, maybe just in a person's own self and how they talk to themselves and the narratives they spend for their own lives? Well, on a personal level, that same skill set that I use to write that journal entry I use on myself all the time. I mean, if like if I have a scenario where my car gets hit in the parking lot, 
I use that same... I, I could apply it toward all the negative things, but I apply it... I attempt to apply it. I'm not always perfect at it. But I attempt to apply that spin toward finding the narrative that does make me feel empowered, makes me feel positive. Like I have a sense of empowerment. And that's something that I think introverted feeling can do a lot of, is find the narrative that gives me a sense of empowerment on a personal level. But I imagine that things aren't always rainbows and bunnies. So No, they're not. When you are legit dealing with a problem in your life, let's just take it as a personal level. Maybe there's a major challenge. Maybe there's a challenge between us, right? Like as a, as a married couple, we don't have, like there are problems sometimes that need to be addressed. There are challenges that need to be addressed. I imagine you're not always just spinning it in this narrative that's like, no, no, everything will be fine because that's also sort of sweeping things under a rug. So how is in, as a person who uses a more mature form of introverted feeling, having done the work you've done, how do you address honest, sincere problems, things that really need to be pointed out and, and, and use that narrative casting ability to do it in the healthiest way possible? Well, okay. So the narrative casting wouldn't necessarily come into something like that. It, the narrative casting is basically a way for me to unlock a pathway forward to get out of being feeling stuck sometimes on a personal level. Now it can be done to find the positive in like maybe a relationship dynamic challenge, something like that. Like I could, I could do it to some degree in that scenario. Why introverted feeling? I don't think it's really even narrative. It's the question. Why? You know, why do I care about this? What am I preserving? What, what, to what end? These are those three questions I ask myself so many times a day. It's crazy. Like, if I'm frustrated about something or I'm like stressed about something, I go, why am I stressed about this? And I try to drive down as deep as I can to find the motivations of that stress or that anxiety or that frustration. Uh, or maybe I'm excited about something. Why am I excited about this? What's the reason I'm excited about this? What's the meaning behind it? Because, you know, again, for layers of complexity, like, like somebody that wants to start a business, for example, have their own home business, they actually don't want to have their own home business. They want to have all the things that having a home business represents. So if they track their motivation to why they want to start a home business, you know, a digital business they can work out of their home from, their motivations might be to spend more time with their family, travel more. But even those motivations are driven by something deeper. Why do you want to spend time with your family? Why do you want to travel more? And then you might say, well, I want to spend time with my family because I grew up in a household that spent a lot of time together and I, you know, I value it. I think kids will do better if I spend more time with them. Uh, and then you have to ask yourself, well, why do I want my kids to do better? And you keep driving down this motivation road of why, 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 why? Well, why is that important to me? As far as you can drive it. Like that's that's what I do in those situations more than narrative casting. Narrative casting is almost like the action or the movement of something moving forward. But that's not diagnostic. Narrative casting is almost proactive. And sometimes I can do it rapidly to ensure I can move forward in some kind of a scenario. I'll find a quick narrative to make me do to help me do that. Right. If I've my car gets hit and I got to get to another appointment instead of sitting there and freaking out and, f and fretting and being mad, I can find another narrative, get to the next appointment, and then I can unpack it later. So that's like a quick hit I can get to. But I would say that why and to what end and what am I preserving is really the key here. Because the thing we didn't talk about with introverted feeling is I believe it's one of the functions, if not the function, closely tied to identity or to ego, which comes from identity, right? This ego part of us. Every change for an introverted feeling person is an identity change. Every new way of seeing things or experiencing things is an identity change. So introverted feeling people either get really good at rapid ego development and ego change quickly, or they go into some kind of a narrative casting protection of that ego change. And I think that's where that, that darker parts of introverted feeling come from. The narrative casting to spin that thing. I wanted to protect my ego on that mission trip. So I spin a narrative to try to protect my ego from feeling something it didn't want to feel. Right, and I don't, I don't have enough nuance right now to unpack all my motivations. There, I haven't really. Ref it was just a quick example I thought of, so I, I haven't really thought through all my motivations there. Um, but I think there's. I'm sure if I looked at, it, I would know what they were. Uh, what was your question again? I, I lost track when I was going down that road. Uh, my original question was, how can introverted feeling use its ability to narrative cast in a oh, positive yeah. way when it's trying to say influence a social movement? I think that question's too soon. I think that's too early of a question because I don't even think like if you're an introvert, maybe you're ready for that as an introvert feeling person listening, but I doubt if you are like most of us still need to go inward and sort out the why to what end and what am I preserving questions, right? I've got, 
you know, I've got this this aspect of myself. What am I preserving? Why am I holding on to this belief or this structure or this thing or this whatever? Like, what am I preserving? What do I hope I'm preserving here? Uh, why do I feel that way? To what end am I going to play this completely out? Like, why am I going to have this stance? And to what end? What's the logical end of this road? Where does this go? Like, how is this going to end if I keep going this road, this route? You know, let's say you and I are in a fight or we're in a disagreement, Antonia. And I'm like, I'm going to show her. I'm going to withhold emotion from her or connection or intimacy. And I have to ask myself, to what end? Like, if I keep going down that road, it's going to lead to us not having intimacy ever, right? So, and if it's like, to what end? I go, oh, it's actually just to get her to behave in this way or it's to get her to feel this thing or thing. Or asking myself then knows what my motivations are and I realize why I'm doing what I'm doing and it starts to give me some element of influence. I wouldn't say control, but influence over those processes before we can even get to a place of knowing how to use that same influence in the social scene or a cause or anything like that, you have to become a master of it in yourself because these are energies you're playing with inside yourself that are very nuanced. And if you start just taking what you think, what you think you know, or what you think you know about yourself and start applying it toward external thing, you might do a lot of damage that way. So you better be sure. What is it? Uh, I don't know who said it, probably Teddy Roosevelt or somebody like that said, uh, you know, be sure you're right, then go ahead. It's kind of thing, but be sure you have this dialed in before you move forward on something. And I think that's the thing that we as introverted feeling people have to do is we've got to really sit and get mastery over ourselves before we can get mastery over anything else. And a true master, somebody that's truly effectual is effectual over themselves. Someone that truly shows up empowered in the world is empowered over themselves. Somebody that truly has the ability to affect things and move and inspire can affect things and inspire themselves. I think that's where it starts with you. And I think that's also something introverted feeling reminds us of is, you know, we're going to die alone. You listening right now will be dead within 100 years, barring any kind of medical technology that will keep you alive longer. I'll be dead and Tony will be dead. The three of us will be dead in 100 years, most likely. And we're all three going to die alone. Like we're not going to die together with anybody else. We're going to die alone. Now, there might be people around, depending, but certainly the people you came into this life with probably aren't going to be people you exit with. Your parents aren't going to be there probably going to be your spouse or your kids or somebody else. So who you started life with is going to be different than who you end life with. And really, at the end of the day, you are the only sovereignty that you have. And that's the other thing about introverted feeling is I think it's really after this concept of sovereignty. Not freedom necessarily, but sovereignty, knowing that you are a complete total entity into yourself, having full empowerment unto yourself, and you are the origination point for the decisions you make. And I think probably to other types, that sounds insane. Like, what? How, how, could, you, how could you say that? That's so selfish. But again, I, I look at it, it's like, I'm the only one that can make the determination. I'm the only one that is me. So how can you know what's better for me than I know what's better for me? It's impossible for you to know that. Now, my behavior might be unacceptable to you or to a crowd in the outside world, but my motivations and who I am, like, I'm the only one that gets to determine whether that's okay or not. I'm the only one that gets to determine whether that's something that I'm okay being or, or showing up as. You, you don't get to out there because how could you? Why, why does your selfishness of what you want me to be trump my selfishness of what I want to be? You go be who you want to be. <laughs> Let me be who I want to be. I think this is a very introverted feeling way of seeing the world. So the antidote then that for somebody using introverted feeling, uh, the antidote to spinning a narrative to to try to use the power of narratives to get an end accomplished the the antidote to that is to go inside oneself and be incredibly self-reflective and yeah. and to master that component of it and then you didn't necessarily say this but i guess i'm putting two and two together from something you previously previously said which is that introverted feeling is um you didn't use this word, but this is the word that came up for me. Uh, it's really impacted by models or like things it sees or people it sees. Um, gosh, I'm trying to remember the specific words you used, but basically like, uh, like, like it's not really that great at talking about things. It's more great at like acting them out and behaving. Them. Oh, it's um, it's more demonstrative than exploitative. Exactly. So exploitative a word. Yeah. I think yeah. <laughs> and so then demonstration becomes, I would imagine, a, also a powerful tool beyond just yeah. narrative. Yeah. And so by by really getting inside one's intent and motivation and and asking questions like to what end, the connection I'm making is that then you become a demonstrator 
you become sort of the model for whatever those values are and whatever that identity is and whatever the intent is that you're you're choosing to pl- apply your um, sort of you're choosing to apply your uh, energy towards. Yeah. Be- because you mentioned also that our our desires and our, in- our intent is what we choose as the thing we're going to focus on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so there's this concept in Julia Cameron's book, The Artist Way, it talks about this idea of a shadow artist where let's say you want to be a movie maker and like a, f- a film director. And instead of actually going and being a film director, you become like a script reader or a personal assistant to some director or something. And you've always wanted to be this thing, but you don't feel like you can, like for whatever reason, you don't have permission, you don't have skill, you don't feel like you have the opportunity, whatever. So you become a shadow artist satelliting around the real art you want to do. And I would argue that the film, the movie director that becomes the director, like truly, they wanted to be a movie director and they became the movie director. I believe they're still a shadow artist. I still think they're externalizing themselves because I think when introverted feeling is done all the way to its core essence, you don't have to have an art because you are the art. You are the expression. You don't have to. You can have them as ancillary things, as results from yourself. But true introverted feeling, when it's expressed in the self fully, if you're an introverted feeling person, you probably know what I'm talking about. You become your life, your essence, the person that you are is the expression of what you're bringing to the world. It's not the film director role or whatever other role. All of those are shadow artists to the true you. So you are, you know, I think Shakespeare is the one that said the, you know, all the world's a stage. We're merely actors on it or I don't get that quote right, but something to that gist. And I think that's a very introverted feeling perspective that your life is the character. You are the art. Your behaviors and all of that is is your expression. Everything else is secondary when you're doing introverted feeling right. So you don't have to spin a narrative. You become the narrative. That is correct. Absolutely. Okay. I think that that's super interesting. And it probably sounds like I'm asking you leading questions, but the reality of the situation is that we didn't talk at all about this. <laughs> I have no podcast. idea. I don't even know how this long this went. I've been like in a channeling space of just like <laughs> kind of this FI weird haze. I'm just answering yeah. as my authenticity comes up. And which is f- fantastic. So the, the the podcast title to go along with the series is "Why Does the World Need Introverted Feeling?" And what I'm what I'm kind of getting from you uh, as the culmination of all this is that people who are exceptional at introverted feeling become the models that we all need. Like they become the expression and the manifestation of something of something powerful and. And we need that. We need people to not spin narratives, but be the narrative. We need people to be demonstrations of goodness or of, you know, of like, a, like, like, let's say, let's say the person still is part of a movement. They're not going to have to spin narrative. They, they will be the embodiment of the movement. They will be the thing that everybody looks toward as almost like a pure expression of that movement. They'll be demonstrating what they want to see. They'll be demonstrating a, the world that they're trying to sort of move, uh, help everybody move toward because they've done the hard work of really making sure that they've answered the questions of what is my intent, what do I actually want, and to what end. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's a pretty good way to put it. I, before we wrap up, though, and if you, unless you're not complete here on what your question was, no, I think I, I, I think uh, yeah, I think that that's a good encapsulation. I uh, I've been doing a lot of talking. You've done a ton of questioning. Thank you for that. I, it's been uh, it's been fun actually. I've enjoyed kind of channeling my inner introverted feeling. What you know from your perspective as a thinker, somebody who has to interface with us feelers of the world, how like you have probably a thinker perspective of what introverted feelings brought into your life. You've always been attracted to it. It's been something like you've had friendships and lover relationships and now you're married to an introverted feeling or yeah, introverted feeling person. Why, like, what is the, what is the benefit in your life personally? Maybe not on gestalt in society, but what have you seen from yourself? And that might resonate with someone too. Uh, Of the value of introverted feeling? Yeah. I mean, how, like, why, you know, why do you think the world needs it based on your experience, your personal experience? Very introverted think, feeling way of asking this, by the way. So, <laughs> give me your experience, yeah, Antonio. I will. I will give you my experience. So, um, growing up, one of my best friends, who I met at like seventeen years old, 
uh, one of my best friends was an INFP, and then my first husband was an INFP, and then now I'm married to an ENFP. And so I've always been very attracted to introverted feeling. And um, I think what particularly the INFPs in my life have brought, but I would imagine that this is the case with anybody who's leading with introverted feeling. So ISFPs, I would imagine this applies to too, is uh, there was a um, there was a kindness that I was lacking. Like I've always had a lot of, I always did my best to develop a concept of agape love. Agape being um, the Greek word for principled love, which is like a general love for humanity as a whole, like just humanity because people live... And because they're, you know, because they exist, I love them. But I struggled to love individuals. Like people were very annoying to me. They were very obnoxious. I didn't really understand why people did what they did. And I was highly judgmental. And it was through long conversations that I had with my really good friend Katie throughout my 20s. I I would say these super, like just super harsh things about people. Like really harsh. Make these throwaway judgments about them. I thought a lot of people were kind of useless. And I remember she'd always do the same thing. <laughs> she called me Tones. And uh, anytime I said something that was like particularly horrifying to her, she'd just go, Tones. And she'd just do this in kind of this like mildly disappointed voice. And I knew uh, as soon as I said that, I knew I had said, said something horrifically insensitive and that Katie was going to help me see another side. And she would. She would. She She helped me understand not just she wouldn't even just say what was going on for the person it wasn't like she was deconstructing their perspective it wasn't like she was like breaking down what was happening for them she would just talk about the benefits of seeing people in a kinder way like you don't like she would oftentimes say things like you don't know what's going on for them you don't you don't know that and I would have to stop like she wouldn't explain things she would just remind me that I didn't know what I was talking about that I was making these I was pattern recognizing something that I couldn't possibly know to be true, especially since my pattern recognition was clearly biased by a negativity. And as soon as she would say, you don't know that to be true, I would have to go, yeah, you're right. I don't know that to be true. (laughs) I don't know that at all. I'm just talking shit. And I think after her being my closest friend for over a decade, unfortunately, she died in 2010 and it was like one of the biggest losses of my life next to my sister. Uh, like every time she would do that, uh, I would get kindness training, not just like agape love, not principled love training. I would get specifically individual kindness training. And uh, my first husband, Dan, was also very good about that. And, uh, and I think you've been exceptionally good at that. And what I learned from them was kindness in general. I think what I've learned from you is kindness toward myself. Like I've um, being being with you since 2010, actually, you and I met about a month after she died or not even right around the same time. No, I think we met before she passed away because I was in conversation with you when you told me. OK, so like it was almost an overlap. Like we met it was within a week, within, it was within a week or two of meeting you. Right. And um, yeah, that's right. You're right. And uh, and so uh, you came into my life just as she exited. And what you've brought to me that has accentuated her influence of kindness and my first husband Dan's influence of kindness and holding space. Um, I think what you've brought to me is this idea of seeing myself more compassionately. Like I, I see myself in a more compassionate way because of because of the influence you've brought. That's weird because I feel like I see myself very harshly. And I, for a long time in our relationship, I felt like that's interesting that you got got that from me because I I'm so self deprecating and so self correcting. It must be from it must be from me seeing you in a way that I didn't even see myself. It's true. Yeah. No. You you see me as better than I've ever seen me. And so when I've said things about my like you you and you don't do it through words. You do it through demonstration. Like you are so kind to me, and you do such a good job of reflecting to me so many positive things um, that you it's like you believe in me actually that's probably what it is is that I what I read from you is that you believe in me and uh, and that's that's something that I haven't always had through my life is somebody really believing in me and so through demonstration you've taught me to see myself in a much more positive much kinder light and so um, so to me introverted feeling gives a gentleness to this introverted judging perspective that I have. Because I I also use an introverted judging function. I use introverted thinking, which can be clean and clear 
and have so many benefits to it, in my opinion, but it doesn't always remember to be kind. It doesn't always remember to be gentle. And I think that's what I've really picked up from introverted feeling is that when you're making these internal assessments to uh, to make sure you're adding the component of kindness. You know, when you said that you feel like I believe in you, I think that is something that you listening, if you're an introverted feeling person, we struggle with, I think a lot of us believe in other people more than we believe in ourselves. And that's probably going to be the work of your life, honestly. If you're introverted feeling, it's probably going to be bringing that belief that you probably have for other people. Almost, It's almost an illogical, pig-headed belief that they will be XYZ successful or, or you know, this positive thing you can project for people. I bet you... I bet you as an introverted feeling person listening can be very inspiring to those in your life and really make them go, wow, they believe in me. I could do this. And I think some of the work for you, the power, I think that's why the world needs introverted feeling. It has a tendency to, beyond reason and logic, believe in people. And then we're surprised they rise to the occasion. When you believe in somebody, they often will rise to whatever you believe they can do or not believe they can do, quite frankly. And if you can move that from externalizing it, again, not a shadow artist, not a shadow believer, believing in yourself, you are the expression. You are believing in your own essence, your own goodness of motivations, not externalizing everything all the time and bringing it in house and see yourself in that good light. That becomes to be magic and true power at the core of your introverted feeling. You want to talk about being able to move through the world and create magic around you. When you're able to get there as an introverted feeling person, believing in yourself, feeling confident, and knowing that you are the expression and the embodiment of your expression, magic will follow you. Yeah. Well, people will follow you anywhere. Mag- yeah. And, and whatever that magic looks like, whether it's leading people or inspiring people or creating something or whatever, I believe that'll create magic in the world. So yeah. So yeah. that's... Uh, <laughs> So do you feel complete, by the way? I don't have any more questions. I think that you've, I, I think I'm persuaded. <laughs> in, in classic introverted feeling space, and again, the introverted feeling people listening will know this, we hit stop in the next 20 minutes. I'm going to go, oh, I should have said that. I should have said that. I should have said that. Because right now I'm like in the flow of how I feel and I'm like right tapped into it. So all the the quote unquote external markers of the things I quote unquote should have said are, uh, I did a lot of quote unquote this, this episode, didn't I? Uh, they're going to all come to me later. Well, maybe you can record them, and then anybody who is, uh, anybody who's subscribed to our Facebook chat, um, our Facebook personality hacker, what is it called? It's not a group; it's a page. <laughs> My, our Facebook page. No promises. I might not have anything comes. You might not have anything that comes up, but if you do, then you can just upload it to our Facebook page. Yeah, I'll do that if it if it comes later. All right, sounds good. All right, I I like I said, I'm persuaded. I think the world needs introverted feeling. <laughs> Was I was I a good enough advocate for it? I think you were a fantastic advocate, and I really appreciate you letting me be the interviewer. Yeah, and if you've been listening along, I, I, and you're an introverted feeling person, or maybe you have a person like that in your life, what do you think introverted feeling brings to the world? What's your perspective? Why do we need it in our world? What can it do for us? Come over to personalityhacker.com, leave a comment, ask a question, share your story. Tell us why the world needs introverted, introverted feeling directly below this podcast. We'd love to hear from you. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. Uh, Leave us a rating and review on iTunes. That helps us out a lot. And of course, our book is available at Books A Million, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, all sorts of retailers. So go get yourself a copy if you haven't. It's not that expensive. I think it's less than like, I don't know, a Chipotle burrito bowl and a drink. So go get yourself one. Your life is not complete without this book on your bookshelf. That's right. That's what you're supposed to say. (laughs) Your life life, is not complete. (laughs) You are 99% complete. And once you get the Personality Hacker book, you will now be 100% complete as a person. What does the slap chop say? You'll have an exciting life with the slap chop. That's right. You'll have an exciting life with the Personality Hacker book. (laughs) Yeah. And it could probably be multiple uses if you run out of time. I mean, you can use it for... Coasters. Coasters. Anything else if you need to. You uh, Fuel for fires. Let's say we hit the apocalypse and we need to burn something. To... Ooh, if that's the case, they should get more than one copy. Yes. That's a reason to get like 10 copies, to have fuel during the apocalypse. During the zombie apocalypse, you're going to so, want 10 copies of Personality Hacker. And then, it's, and, it's a 450-page book. That's yeah. a lot of fuel. And, and you could keep maybe an 11th copy just for reference as that's you right. rebuild the new society to know how the personality types work together. Oh, I mean, there's totally so many uses. Right. 
You're it's, totally right. It's it's endless. So your life is not complete. Okay. You, oh, it's thick enough. You could cut a hole and keep a flask in it. You totally could. You could hide things on your bookshelf with this book because it's thick enough. You could cut all sorts of uh, patterns out and hide things from the feds. Illegal narcotics. Or anything else you want to hide. Laundered money. Anything, really, <laughs> as long as it fits inside that book. So, I mean, this book is... Yeah, it's multi-purpose. Uh, you need 11 copies of the book to be complete. 10 for the zombie apocalypse for fuel to feed your fire. And then the 11th one to rebuild civilization. Yeah. All right. I think that's a pretty good plug. That'll be that'll be our new mark. <laughs> Marketing for the book slogan. <laughs> 11 copies just to be safe. All right. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we will talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. Podcast.